Tess. Just a bit. Baik, selamat pagi Ibu dan Bapak dan Saudara-saudara para mahasiswa. Senang sekali hari ini kita dan untuk tiga kali pertemuan yang akan datang juga, kita kedatangan tamu Profesor David Marpaung dari Universitas Twente. Profesor David Marpaung juga saat ini adalah ejang profesor pada Fakultas Matematika dan Ilmu Pengetahuan Alam Institut di Bandung dan uh, dalam kapasitasnya sebagai ajang profesor ini Pak David akan memberikan kuliah tentang integrated photonics salah satu bidang yang uh, beliau kembangkan sejak 10-15 tahun yang lalu ya Pak David dan beliau akan sharing tentang risetnya sampai dengan yang paling mutakhir uh, kami sangat berharap dari program studi fisika dan khususnya dari kelompok keahlian fisika magnetik dan fotonik bahwa dari rangkaian kuliah yang akan disampaikan Pak David ini kita bisa belajar sesuatu dan mungkin kita bisa uh, memulai suatu kerjasama dengan Universitas Twente. Tanpa mengambil waktu yang lebih banyak, saya persilakan Pak David, silakan. Oke. Okay. Semuanya bisa denger ya, mudah-mudahan juga yang online. Jadi pertama-tama terima kasih banyak buat Pak Alex, Pak Agung, buat kelompok kita juga yang sudah mengajukan uh, untuk uh, ya saya bisa terlibat dalam uh, riset dan pengajaran di ITB sebagai jang profesor. Uh, ini sebuah kehormatan dan juga sesuatu yang sangat um, Ya, exciting buat saya juga ya. Dan terima, terima kasih juga buat kesempatan ini untuk bisa uh, memberikan uh, kuliah ini juga untuk teman-teman yang sudah datang dan yang sudah hadir online. Um, jadi judul dari uh, lecture series ini adalah uh, A New Era of Integrated Photonics. Ya. Nanti kita juga bisa lihat dalam kuliah ini bahwa sebenarnya Integrated Photonics itu sudah Uh, dikembangkan uh, cukup lama ya, tapi pada saat ini uh, segala um, infrastruktur dan uh, kemampuan untuk memfabrikasi optical wave guide seperti yang ada di di uh, slide ini juga uh, pushing the field towards uh, maturation dan juga bisa digunakan untuk kehidupan yang sehari-hari. Oke, okay. uh, untuk untuk kuliah ini mungkin saya akan coba sebisa mungkin dalam bahasa Indonesia tapi kalau mempunyai I got stuck kita switch ke, ke dalam bahasa Inggris jadi mudah-mudahan tidak ada masalah oke okay. uh, mungkin kita bisa mulai oh, oke okay. ya yeah. ini ada dua logo ya jadi uh, uh, biasanya kita juga acknowledging funding bodies yang memberikan dana untuk uh, riset kita. NWO ini adalah yang namanya Dutch Research Council. Jadi uh, saat aku memulai uh, riset di Twente, uh, sekitar lima tahun yang lalu, uh, 
aku dapat grant yang namanya VD, jadi untuk uh, mid career researcher, jadi itu memberikan sekitar 800 ribu euro uh, untuk memulai grup yang ada di Twente. Nah, dua tahun lalu atau tahun lalu uh, uh, grup kami juga mendapatkan funding dari European Research Council. Nah, European Research Council ini memberikan dana untuk uh, individual, untuk researcher yang uh, menulis proposal yang baik gitu ya dengan track record yang bagus dan uh, kita dapat dua setengah juta euro tahun ini untuk melaksanakan riset di Integrated Photonics ini. Switching nggak dia? Nggak. Hmm. Oke, okay, jadi sedikit perkenalan ya. Um, pada saat ini saya bekerja sebagai uh, full professor atau guru besar di University of Twente di Belanda. Jadi kita ada di bagian timur Belanda. Uh, dan saya memimpin sebuah grup riset yang bernama Nonlinear Nanophotonics. Jadi fokus kita, uh, jadi grup saya berada di uh, interface antara engineering dan science uh, dan fokus kepada integrated optics. Uh, saya juga dulu anak fisika ITB, dari masuk tahun 98 selesai tahun 2002, dan setelah itu melanjutkan uh, pendidikan S2 dan S3 juga di University of Twente, dan uh, saya juga sempat spending beberapa saat di University of Sydney sebagai Research Fellow dan Senior Research Fellow. Oke, okay. <laughs> ya jadi ini menunjukkan aja uh, uh, apa ya area dari University of Twente. University of Twente ini Um, well, we are located in Enschede, so it's an eastern part of the Netherlands. Uh, Satu-satunya uh, universitas di, di Belanda yang punya full campus set. Jadi di dalam kampus, uh, staff dan student bisa bekerja, bisa belajar, bisa tinggal juga, bisa melakukan sport, leisure, dan lain-lain. Dan kita juga punya uh, program applied physics, ya, jadi fisika terapan yang sudah 10 tahun berturut-turut menjadi top program di uh, di Belanda. Jadi uh, sebuah program yang sangat uh, prominen dan lumayan membagakan buat kami juga di Twente. Nah, ini ada beberapa foto yang menunjukkan bagaimana suasana kampus di Twente ini uh, di uh, bagian depan dari universitasnya sendiri uh, dan yang menarik adalah ada beberapa gedung baru yang kita bangun juga untuk fasilitas dari riset dan pendidikan. Nah, yang lumayan penting buat riset integrated photonics di Twente adalah yang namanya Mesa Plus Nanolab. Jadi Nanolab ini sendiri um, adalah tempat di mana kita bisa memfabrikasi uh, micro and nanostructures. Jadi uh, for this Nanolab we have uh, 1250 meter square clean room area around 1000 meter square area for specialized equipment ya. Jadi kita juga bisa memfabrikasi mendeposisi. Jadi kita bisa deposit, deposit um, silicon nitride, aluminium oxide, aluminium nitride dan various uh, piezo materials. Bisa juga uh, etching jadi structuring dari dari struktur-struktur uh, ini dan juga bisa imaging dan melakukan uh, apa pengukuran dari dari struktur-struktur ini. Nah, grup kami sendiri namanya Nonlinear Nanophotonics. Jadi kami sekitar mungkin sekitar 15 orang pada saat ini dan uh, uh, we are recruiting ya. Yeah? So we are looking for 10 uh, positions PhD student, postdocs, assistant professors and also technicians. Uh, grup kami cukup multikultural, jadi ada uh, beberapa orang Belanda, dari Cina, India, Indonesia, dan juga dari Kanada. Dan fokusnya adalah experimental physics. So we are doing experimental physics, focusing on lasers and integrated photonics. Ya. Nah, aplikasi dari teknologi ini juga sangat luas. Uh, satu yang kita uh, teliti adalah dari aplikasi di bidang telekomunikasi. Tapi juga Uh, nowadays, there are more and more uh, implementation of this technology towards uh, quantum computing, uh, teknologi kuantum, dan advanced sensor. Jadi topik-topik ini juga yang kami teliti di grup kami. Oke, okay. 
So we are going towards what is uh, the core of the research, right? So when we talk about uh, photonic circuits, this is just a canonical picture of that. So you have a chip size of this much, let's say. Um, dan chip ini sendiri um, um, terdiri dari berbagai komponen ya, yang terintegrasi dan um, uh, apa, gelombang cahaya sendiri akan di couple dari optical fiber menuju chip dan keluar lagi dari chip tersebut. Nah, uh, some people have the misconception that integrated photonics is just the chip. And that is, in my opinion, that is totally wrong. Right, because then to be able to take the whole uh, capabilities of the chip, you need to surround it with diagnostics, and you need to surround it with other components. So this is just a, a typical situation uh, in a setup in our lab, and then you see that the, the the chip that you previously saw here actually sits here, right? And it's just a very small volume of the total system. So what is the total system doing? Um, it actually controls the or actuates the signal into the chip and monitors that. Jadi, uh, apa, um, infrastruktur ini sendiri juga sangat penting untuk bisa mendapatkan the full capability of the photonic chip. By the way, kalau ada pertanyaan langsung tanya aja ya. atau mungkin kalau banyak ada yang burning question from the Zoom audience, just ask. Okay. Nah, um, walaupun masih baru ya, although we are quite new, so it's around 40 years that we've been at Twente, uh, we are striving to do world-class science and then we are trying to make waves in uh, in our research. Right. So this uh, some of the the things that have made to the news, to the front page of the university, whether there is a grant or uh, there's a paper in uh, Nature Photonics or maybe uh, some some other results, right? But then uh, it's quite interesting that recently we also made it, so this is from this month, um, uh, we managed to create a photonic chip that traps not only light waves, but also sound waves. So this really, a strong interaction between light and sound. I think you can also see the difference between uh, <laughs> a few years of uh, heavy pressure of research. <laughs> but uh, yes, y yes, like horizontally, you mean? <laughs> yeah, okay. So now about the lecture itself. So how did we come to this? This was like uh, uh, a result of a discussion between me and Alex about several things. And then one of the things that we saw right now is that integrated photonics is a, is a very important field that will take prominent effect in our daily life. Um, we already see it in the Netherlands right now that uh, we have a lot of funding in two areas, integrated photonics and quantum computing. And they can be coupled. Mereka bisa uh, bekerja bersama ya, antara teknologi kuantum dan teknologi fotonik. Uh, tahun ini aja, uh, pemerintah Belanda memberikan 1,1 juta, 1,1 billion, billion itu apa? Miliar. 1,1 miliar euro buat Uh, riset di teknologi kuantum dan satu miliar euro buat um, uh, riset di bidang fotonik. Nah, from from that kind of investment, there's a lot of opportunities for people to do advanced research for this, right? And I think that uh, well, the group here in ITB. My group in Twente and some other stakeholders should play a role to actually allow our students to take part in uh, such an exciting field. Um, but then the starting point would be education, right? So then I propose to Palexia, uh, part of this uh, professorship, uh, we should make a lecture series. And then the lecture series is not 
uh, aim to go deep into all aspects because that's rather impossible. But then to give the students and uh, everyone who attends it a holistic view of the field, right? Uh, what are the important basic questions that we should address? And then uh, how, how do you make, let's say, photonic circuits? Uh, and then, um, so in the, in the first lecture today, for example, then we will talk about the fundamental of integrated photonics, some basic functions and material platforms. These are very important. Uh, tomorrow, we will talk about components, how to assemble these basic functions into a working components, right? Um, minggu depan, kita akan melihat uh, various applications of this technology. Uh, for example, uh, photonics becomes more and more like electronics. Jadi, photonics sendiri sekarang sudah seperti uh, apa sirkuit elektronik yang sangat programmable. Ya. Jadi, sirkuitnya stay the same, tapi um, functions-nya bisa banyak dan itu diaktifasi dengan program. Another part that we will talk about next week is nonlinear optics, how light interacts with matter and interacts with other uh, uh, wavelengths of light through matters. Yeah? Dan pada akhirnya kita juga akan bicara tentang emerging application, uh, dan mungkin kita juga bisa touch upon uh, classical and quantum computing, if we make it next week. Okay, so let's just go on with the lecture. Uh, fundamental of photonics. So I will start with this slide, right? So this is just taken from a YouTube video that was put by Intel. And I think this is quite profound. The statement said 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years alone. And maybe, I, I think this is really powerful. We are really in a diff different era, right? Uh, where data uh, is taking over our daily lives. So, but then this amount of data, right? This much of data, how do they go about? How are they in distributed? How do they end up um, in my computer, in my phones, and so on and so forth? Well, actually, there's a very prominent optical technology that enables this, right? So this is just taken from Twitter, problem, but, uh, you know, uh, so this is the 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 map of um, optical fibers that connects almost everywhere uh, people in the world, right? So this is actually enabled by two Nobel Prize photonic winning invention, right? The first one is laser. So the laser is um, activated with uh, with the information your YouTube videos or your tweets and so on and so forth. And that is modulated into a coherent wave, which is the laser. And it's transported from one place to another via optical fiber. And these are two Nobel Prize winning invention. In 1964, Towns, Basov, and Prokhorov uh, were awarded this uh, Nobel Prize uh, in physics for the invention of laser. And then much, much later in 2009, Char um, um, Charlie Kao was uh, awarded the, the Nobel Prize in uh, physics for the invention of optical fiber. Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> Okay, I will stop sharing first. Huh? And then, so it was in the presenter view in? Yeah, in the Zoom. Ah, uh, okay. How do I do that? And then... 
Yeah, it's okay. All right. So where were we? Uh, how do I move this? Okay. Um, so yeah, two Nobel Prize winning inventions that enables all the transfer of information in the world right now. So it's pretty important photonics. Okay, so when I was doing this slides and then this lecture, I was thinking, okay, so you have so many fibers going around, right? From one place to another. Where do they end up? So what's happening in this point and that point? Jadi semua optical fiber ini, yeah, running around the world, they have to end up somewhere, right? Any guess? Anybody? I prefer the students, of course, not the staff. Well, they, you can guess. I don't know, some form? Eventually, yes. But they end up in... Uh, the suspense. No, I cannot flick. Just a moment. Okay, before seeing that, of course, that uh, why we can do this uh, uh, this kind of long long distance transmission using the optical fiber is because the transmission loss of the optical fiber is very, very low, right? So for wavelength, which is called the third uh, window of telecommunication around 1550 nanometer, uh, the attenuation of this optical fiber is 0.25 dB per kilometer. And that is really low, right? So you can go uh, really long without um, losing your signal. Okay, the answer to my previous question is that they end up in data centers. You've heard about this, right? So you have this kind of farm uh, consisting of racks. So these are called, uh, so this is a data center and these are called racks, right? And we will see what will have, what is happening inside the racks. But then uh, the number, the growth of number of data centers is, um, unprecedented right now so this is just showing the area for can i move this i don't know how to do it anyway yeah the the the, the area that is occupying the data centers right now for example this is from google is increasing rapidly so for example they built a data center in 2009 and then uh three years it takes three years to build another one, and then it just takes two years to build another one, and then it's every year it's increasing, right? Because then the growing uh, amount of data that we have, and then these are massive and big. And of course, there's a lot of data centers also in Indonesia. For example, this one is an NTT one in Jakarta. Okay, so what's happening in these data centers and what is how, how photonics can play a role? So in these data centers, you have this connection of optical fibers going into the rack, right? And there are much more traffic occurring in the data center as compared to the traffic going between them, right? So uh, if you take, let's say, one rack, right? Uh, you have one, this is called a blade, let's say, part of this rack, and then you have already optical transceivers sitting in this rack, right? Transceivers is a short between uh, transmitter and receiver, so it's like a double function between transmitting and receiving. So if you zoom in of this, each of this transceiver, what you see is that you have photonic circuit sitting inside this transceiver, right? And then for a material that is being used uh, for Intel, in particular, because this is for, uh, for Intel, they use silicon photonics. And we will learn about silicon photonics later 
uh, in this lecture, right? So this is just showing that uh, integrated photonics is already enabling our daily lives and it will play much more role, right? So this is a picture of uh, the, the cartoon that I was showing before. So these are the part of the rack. These are the, 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 the section, the blade, let's say. And then these are the transceivers. And this here, if you can look really, really closely, there's a upside down called uh, EFECT, E-F-F-E-C-T. This is a company. Uh, sitting in the Netherlands, uh, in the in Eindhoven, so uh, so we are in the eastern part of the Netherlands. Eindhoven is a bit uh, south, let's say. Um, and uh, finally, I used to sit in the same room as the CEO of Effect. So he was also studying in a master program at the University of Twente went off, do, did a PhD in Eindhoven, and then now spin off one of the most successful photonics companies um, in the Netherlands and maybe also in the world. And what, what do they do? They integrate their components into this very small form factor such that it can take all this uh, high stream of data from the optical fiber fibers from all over the world and then uh, be part of this uh, uh, application in a data center. Okay, so if you open up one of these uh, boxes, let's say, then this is the kind of assembly that you see, right? So what I mentioned before is that, uh, of course, the photonic chip is just a, a rather small part of the entire technology. So if somebody says that, oh, I, will, I want to do everything with photonics, that person, 99%, he might be lying because then you can't. You need to pair photonics also with high-speed electronics to actually unlock the capability of the whole technology. So I, I remember maybe 20 years ago, the argument is always like, we want to do all photonics, all photonics, right? And then nowadays, people from electronics industry and photonics industries are sitting together and then trying to map out, very important, how to uh, get the technology integrated together, right? And then how to define standards such that if I make a photonic technology and somebody makes an electronic technology, they can go together without much uh, trouble. Okay, so if you zoom in again, then you see this is a typical photonic chip, right? So if I have to guess, uh, this would be an active a chip containing modulators. Modulators are uh, a component that you can use to transfer electronic signal into optical signal. And then as you see that the chip itself, these are called wire bonds, right? So you make uh, this kind of electrical wire going from the chip to a PCB, printed circuit boards to do a uh, uh, fan out, let's say. And then uh, you will see this more and more in this lecture, such that you need to interface this kind of electronic uh, circuit with photonic circuit. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Pertanyaannya adalah, apakah dissipasi energi panas di sistem seperti ini masih menjadi isu? Jawabannya adalah yes. Karena uh, nanti kita bisa lihat juga di kuliah kita bahwa untuk mengubah refractive index ya, indeks bias, jadi uh, kebanyakan implementasi dari photonic chip ini adalah mengontrol interferensi. Nah, bagaimana kita bisa mengontrol interferensi? Kita harus mengubah indeks bias, ya, optical part length, dan pada akhirnya indeks bias. Nah, uh, material itu bisa diubah indeks biasnya dengan beberapa cara. Salah satunya adalah dengan Uh, memanasi sebagian dari waveguide itu. Itu namanya thermo-optical tuning ya. Nah, biasanya dari fotonik chip itu, Pak Agung, uh, disipasi itu datang dari tuningnya. Nah, berbeda dengan uh, elektronik ya. Kalau elektronik, kalau kita punya active komponen seperti amplifier, dia juga mendisipasi panas. Nah, um, 
kesempatan kita di photonics, the opportunity is that if we can get rid of the thermal tuning, go to uh, a non-dissipative tuning, uh, energy consumption dari dari photonics itu bisa jauh lebih rendah dibandingkan dengan electronics. Jadi sisi disipasinya itu lebih ke arah tuning dari komponen ini. Oke, okay. so we are already comparing photonic circuits and electronic circuits, right? Um, jadi uh, integrated electronic circuit kita semua tahu ya, uh, a circuit uh, consisting of components manufactured in one flat piece of typically semiconductor material. Dan kalau banyak kita lihat dari uh, chip again dari Intel. Kita bisa menemukan uh, satu chip consisting of many, 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 and really many, many billions of transistors, right? The same concept applies for photonics. So for photonics, a photonic circuit is a flat chip made of semiconductor, dielectric materials, for example, and it's supposed to consist many, many photonics components. Nah, komponen fotonik itu apa aja? Ada laser, modulator, fotodetektor, optical amplifiers, couplers, filters, attenuators, and so on and so forth, right? And they should be interconnected to make a single circuit. Nah, kadang-kadang konsep integrated fotonik ini juga masih di misuse ya, karena uh, beberapa riset group uh, karena ya. Yeah, uh, The field is relatively young. Jadi beberapa riset group mengklaim integrated photonics, walaupun dalam satu chip ini cuma ada satu waveguide, which is okay, still acceptable these days. But then I think the field will push more and more interconnection of many components uh, in the definition of integrated photonic circuit. Okay, so as uh, mentioned before, the idea is that to be able to make a wafer scale, jadi bisa membuat uh, uh, apa uh, produksi secara masif ya dalam satu wafer, di mana setiap chip itu uh, mempunyai uh, many many functions in a single chip. Jadi idenya adalah dari wafer ini kita bisa dice, bisa menjadi satu chip dan chip itu uh, consisting of many. Uh, functions. Oke, okay. aplikasi dari uh, photonic circuit ini juga sangat luas. Telekomunikasi kita udah mendiskusikannya ya. Uh, tapi nggak cuma itu. Uh, sekarang uh, this kind of photonic chips juga diimplementasikan dalam uh, computing for classical and quantum computing. Um, kalau kita bisa membuat resonator yang yang sangat kualit, quality vektornya atau kualitasnya sangat tinggi, kita juga bisa membuat uh, fotonik biosensor uh, dan uh, teknologi laser tentunya sangat uh, penting. Uh, dan sekarang, uh, for example, European Space Agency uh, and also NASA is looking for uh, uh, laser link communication between satellites, network of satellites uh, in space, and they they need integrated photonic circuits for that because then uh, you cannot put a, an optical table on a on a satellite right so typically they want to have very very small what they call payload of the satellite uh, jadi kita juga akan lihat aplikasi-aplikasi ini minggu depan okay so that was the introduction took some time but <laughs> um sekarang kita akan melanjutkan lecture ini dengan uh, the basics of integrated photonics right? and with the basics of integrated photonics you have to start with optical waveguides ya yeah. sebagian dari teman-teman juga pastinya sudah familiar ya dengan optical waveguide jadi aku nggak akan go very deep into this but then we'll just explain the key concepts of optical waveguides so uh, an optical waveguide uh, is a structure that propagates electromagnetic wave um, and preferably or usually with low loss while preventing expansion in the transfer direction. Jadi kita memang mau memandu ya. Optical waveguide itu kan namanya pandu gelombang. Jadi kita mau memandu 
or molding the flow of light using this kind of structure that you can etch and integrate inside the photonic chip. Nah, ini contohnya adalah uh, optical chip yang dipakai untuk quantum computing dari University of Bristol, the UK. Uh, this consists of beam splitters, di mana kita bisa splitting the 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 laser beam into uh, various directions, let's say, and then some uh, some bands, waveguides. Nah, tentunya uh, panjang gelombang dari cahaya yang bisa dipandu juga uh, bergantung dengan material dan dan uh, struktur dari waveguide tersebut. Nah, ini contoh adalah uh, Optical waveguide, di mana kita propagating red light uh, into the system. Nah, ini dibuat uh, dari material yang disebut dengan silicon nitride uh, dan dibuat di University of Twente bersama dengan spin-off company dari University of Twente yang namanya Lionix. Jadi ini adalah contoh-contoh dari optical waveguides. Oke. Okay. Nah, konsep dari optical waveguide ini sebenarnya sudah sangat lama ya. Jadi kalau kita dig up the first, the very first paper to propose, well, not the optical wave guide, but then the whole concept of integrated photonics, you have to go back to 1969. So, have you heard the saying, there's nothing new under the sun? <laughs> this, is a, <laughs> this is an example, right? So it's again, um, uh, people that were driving this were from Bell Labs. They were really like the, the, the place to develop integrated photonics at that time. Um, and then uh, they propose a waveguide structure uh, consisting of a high index material surrounded by a low index material, typical canonical waveguide structure. We will see that later. And this, uh, the kind of planar waveguide that they envision will be the workhorse of integrated photonics. And they even, so I think this is a team headed by Stuart Miller, um, a concept of um, the, the, the kind of components that we use today. For example, a coupler, where you can send light from this port and then split it into this port and that port and also a concept of a ring resonator that you can build on chip, right? So you have a certain kind of waveguide coupling going around and then goes out. So it's not entirely new. Okay, so most of the optical waveguides that we know today are made from uh, dielectric or sem semiconductor materials. Uh, and then the way they guide light is to, through surrounding uh, high index material with low index material. So this part, the darker blue part is called the core of the optical waveguide. This is the core. And then uh, the lighter blue material surrounding it should be lower index. And this is called the cladding or the bottom one usually is also called substrate, right? And there are many types of uh, optical waveguide. So this is a, a slab waveguide, a strip waveguide, but then don't forget that an optical fiber is also an optical waveguide, right? And then um, later on, we will see that there's a certain kind of spatial distribution of light when they are guided inside this uh, waveguides and this kind of spatial modes, transfer modes, Uh, will play an important role in how you can mold your circuit and then uh, mold the flow of light. Okay, so this is just again showing an overview of uh, what sort of uh, optical waveguides that we have. So an optical fiber has a cylindrical uh, cross-section and then you have a, a core surrounded by cladding. Um, if you take a look at the ones that we can build on chip, right? So rectangular kind of waveguides, you have this kind of embedded strip. So you have a strip of high index material embedded in the, in the cladding, or you can have the cladding and then on top of that, you have the strip, right? Uh, and this is an architecture called the RIP or Ridge Waveguide. 
and then this one is a strip loaded one so you see that this is an optical fiber this is a uh, uh, on-chip waveguide so um, just to give an idea that they don't have the same kind of mode profile and sizes right so a standard single mode fiber has around nine micron diameter of core surrounded by a, a, a bigger cladding let's say and then the kind of light distribution at the end of this optical fiber is actually showing this kind of circular kind of uh, optical mode right now if you take or make such uh, optical waveguide in uh, popular materials these days like uh, 35 semiconductor or silicon or silicon nitride, right you will end up with this kind of uh, uh, cross section and geometry why because you want to have a single mode waveguide so uh, if you actually restrict yourself to single mode waveguide uh, because of the index contrast of this uh, uh, technology, let's say, then you will end up with a much smaller mode. I think this is one important point here is that to couple light from optical fiber to waveguides is not, is not straightforward. Let's say you need effort to do that, right? And then we will talk about the kind of losses mechanism that you will get uh, using these techniques. And then finally, of course, this kind of photonic wire of waveguides, if you now start interconnecting them, you can actually make circuits based on this. So, for example, you have straight bands, a Y branch where you can input light and then split into two uh, uh, paths, let's say, an interferometer, directional coupler, and so on and so forth. Any questions so far? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, pertanyaannya adalah permasalahan dengan smaller waveguide apa? Nanti kita punya satu section membicarakan masalah itu ya. Tapi untuk konteks ini adalah um, perbedaan antara uh, ukuran dari distribusi cahaya di fiber dan ukuran dari distribusi cahaya di small waveguide. Nah, kalau umpamanya nanti ada gambar juga kalau maunya kita potong ini terus kita taruh di tengah di situ. Yang penting adalah overlap dari distribusi cahaya di sini dan di waveguide ini. Kalau adalah ada mode mismatch yang begitu besar uh, most of the light from the optical fiber will be lost. So it will be gone, right? And then loss is a big problem in integrated photonics. You cannot lose your photons, especially if you are doing uh, quantum photonics with single photons. If you have one photon and then you lose it, too bad, right? Okay. Now, yeah, mungkin kita re recap sedikit tentang um, uh, bagaimana kita bisa memandu or how can we guide light in such optical waveguide, right? So this is a geometry of what we call a planar or slab waveguides, right? So you have guiding in one direction. Um, now in the vertical direction, uh, and then how do you do that? You have a, you have to sandwich a high, a high index material, which is the core with the cladding and substrate with a smaller refractive index. So if this is true, let's say uh, the core index is higher than the substrate and the cladding, um, then for a certain kind of angle, you have a total internal refraction, right? So this is the critical angle, right? And then if the angle is actually uh, bigger than the critical angle, then you will have uh, guiding. And then if it's smaller, then you will have a, a, a non-guided wave, and then you have radiation into the substrate, right? So this is the principle of 
optical wave guiding. So you have the core, the cladding, the substrate, and then uh, you have a certain kind of angle of propagation. And the different angle uh, that is allowed to propagate inside the structure uh, constitute the modes. Okay, so this is just a bit of recap again. Um, Jadi, um, one of the key properties, so if you design an optical waveguide, right, and this is very practical, um, I usually ask my students to, to do a design of waveguide, and then they will ask, okay, from which material, and I say, okay, the core should be silicon or silicon nitride, the cladding should be silicon oxide, for example, so they know the refractive indices of this material at a given wavelength. And then um, usually they choose the type of waveguide. So is it a strip waveguide of a rich waveguide and so on and so forth. And then uh, they will try to design the dimension, right? And the way they choose the dimension will determine primarily two things. The first one is the uh, effective index or the propagation constant of the selected modes in the waveguide, right? And then later on, you will see that will also dictate the, the light distribution inside the waveguide. And with these two information, you can actually use it for many, many things. You can use to design your circuit, uh, so interconnect different kind of waveguides, or you can also do a lot of design for nonlinear elements or not near optics and resonators right so um let's take a look at this so remember that i will go back one slide remember that um you have a certain kind of critical angle uh and then above that you have total internal refraction right so the light is bouncing between these two um, interfaces with a certain kind of angle right let's say it's theta m and then if you now map the 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 the, the wave factor let's say of this uh, uh, light component you have a wave factor at the y direction and then at the z direction and z direction is the propagation direction right and then you want to take the projection of this wave factor in the propagation direction and that will constitute your propagation constant of the mode right so you can do the the math and then found out that the the propagation constant of the mode m which is beta m will be uh n1 k0 time the cosine of the angle where the mode is propagating right and then this factor so the n1 cosine theta m is called the effective index so the effective index you can understand it as a let's say as a, as the index or the speed of propagation uh, of that particular modes of the waveguide right and this effective index is typically uh, is below the uh, so it's higher than the index of the cladding and two and lower than the index of the core. So for example, if you have a silicon nitride waveguide, typically it's a core of silicon nitride surrounded by silicon oxide. So the silicon nitride has a refractive index of 1.9, sometimes two, and then the silicon dioxide has a refractive index of 1.45 or 1.5. Now, if you have a single mode waveguide in silicon nitride, uh, the mode will have an effective reflective index of around 1.7, for example. Right? So, this is a typical effective index that you get in, um, uh, in silicon nitride waveguides. Of course, the how uh, whether the uh, effective index is 1.6 or 1.7 or 1.8 depends on the geometry of the waveguide itself, right? So effective index depends on the geometry of the waveguide. 
So you solve it for a particular geometry and then you will get the effective index uh, information. Okay, now it's also good to keep in mind that this effective index depends on the wavelength and the frequency of light, right? So uh, uh, let's say that um, if you if you now plot the the frequency of light versus the propagation constant, you will get this so-called dispersion diagram, right? And from the slope of this. Uh, the, the slope of this uh, curve, you will get the information of the reflective index or the speed of light propagation in light inside the material. So, for example, this is giving the speed of light of the light in the material of the cladding, and this is the uh, speed of light of the light line for the core. And then the guided modes have the dispersion diagram let's say between these two light line right and then of course uh, uh you can see that the there's some sort of bending in the curve of this uh, dispersion of the modes and that is showing that the effective index or the speed of propagation of these modes uh, really depends on the frequency, and this is uh, called dispersion. And then, of course, dispersion is a very important uh, element in integrated optics. Why? Because then you want to design your components to work for a wide range of frequency or wavelength. You have to design the geometry of the waveguide to be able to achieve that uh, property. Or, for example, if you want to do nonlinear optics, you want to do uh, some sort of phase matching between your different nonlinear processes. There is also heavily uh, involving uh, tailoring the dispersion of the uh, of the waveguide. Any question? Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. So the the other property that is important for optical waveguides would be the the mode profile so this is really the light distribution uh in the cross section of the waveguide right and then uh these are associated with different modes in the waveguide uh the lowest order mode uh usually have no zero within the core let's say so you have this kind of uh bell shaped uh, distribution and then as you go higher with the number of modes then you will have uh, different distribution right this is the first order second order and so on and so forth right so the number of zeros within this uh, uh, field of uh, number of zeros of the field within the core uh, are associated with the, the the modes itself and then uh, light propagation inside optical waveguides also can have different polarization, right? So you can have uh, transverse electric, so where you have this electric field transfers to this uh, propagation direction, or you have transverse magnetic as well. So um, as I mentioned before, um, this kind of distribution of the light inside the core is also very important for uh various applications any question no not okay okay so this is just a simulation that i took from a PhD thesis of a uh, of my former phd student uh, this is showing the 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 field so you can have field or intensity distribution of uh light inside a waveguide now the waveguide is uh, 450 by 220 nanometer silicon waveguide so this is a standard uh, geometry for a silicon waveguide you have 450 nanometer width and 220 nanometer thickness and then surrounding this waveguide you have silicon oxide so for silicon the refractive index is around three and a half so you have a really large index contrast between the the uh, the core region and then the surrounding cladding. 
and then um, you can actually plot this field distributions of the of the optical waveguide. So what I didn't do, of course, here, and then I assume that you treat that in your uh, um, lectures, Alex, that how to get into this uh, solving these different modes in optical waveguides. Yeah, this one. No, 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 no. I mean, like in the in the in the in the slap wave guides, let's say with the self consistency. Uh, yeah, okay. So I'm merely brushing uh, through this uh, details of the of the uh, solving the wave equation for the for the optical wave guide, assuming that actually you you guys have done it in a previous lecture. Okay, let me check the time. Oh, we have plenty of time, no? Yeah. Was it 10 10:50? Yeah. Okay. Apa sebenarnya kalau kita punya indeks kontras yang besar dengan form dengan operating budget? Okay. Pertanyaannya adalah apa impact dari uh, indeks kontras yang besar antara core dan cladding? Jadi semakin besar. Uh, Index kontras mungkin aku flick ke oke okay. jadi semakin besar indeks kontras antara core dan cladding uh, semakin kecil mode volume yang bisa kita achieve untuk optical wave guiding itu jadi kalau umpamanya glass glass wave guide seperti ini indeks kontrasnya sangat kecil seperti 0.1 persen ya jadi Uh, perbedaan antara indeks uh, antara cladding dan core itu uh, relatively kecil, jadi uh, mode-nya sendiri juga harus sangat besar ya untuk uh, uh, untuk berpropagasi di waveguide ini. Sedangkan kalau namanya kita punya uh, much higher index contrast, then you can squeeze the the mode into much smaller volume. Pak, saya ingin bertanya. Yo. Untuk uh, mode volume yang besar, berarti kan distribusi uh, profilnya besar tuh. Apakah yeah. itu juga mempengaruhi loss-nya juga? Misalkan mode volume besar, berarti loss-nya juga lebih besar dibanding yang mode volume kecil. Terima kasih. Ya, yeah. terima kasih pertanyaannya. Semuanya bisa dengarkan ya. Um, sebenarnya, in practice ini adalah kebalikan ya. Jadi kalau kita punya indeks kontras yang sangat besar, eh, sorry, sangat kecil, mode volumenya sangat besar, um, biasanya losses dari waveguide itu lebih kecil. Ada beberapa aspeknya. Yang pertama mungkin yang kita akan treat uh, later juga adalah uh, sebenarnya losses dari waveguide itu berasal dari scattering. Scattering dari cahaya yang um, uh, disebabkan oleh mungkin defect dari material, tapi kebanyakan adalah roughness dari waveguide itu sendiri. Jadi kalau namanya ini uh, rectangular waveguide, ya, sepertinya memang ini straight, 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 straight. Gitu. Sebenarnya enggak. Um, roughness itu biasanya terjadi di vertical side walls. Kenapa? Karena kalau umpamanya di horizontal horizontal walls ini atau horizontal boundary ini biasanya disebabkan oleh deposisi dari material ya. Jadi proses deposisi itu biasanya uh, lumayan uh, apa? roughness-nya itu kecil atau mungkin bisa di dipolish lagi supaya uh, roughness di top uh, surface ini juga uh, kecil ya. Tapi kalau side wall ini biasanya disebabkan oleh etching atau removal atau dari material ya. Nah, this kind of chemical chemical process usually induce roughness. Nah, roughness ini impact-nya sendiri akan teramplifikasi kalau umpamanya uh, indeks kontras dari cladding dan core itu sangat besar. Jadi, uh, sebenarnya kalau kita punya mode profile yang sangat kecil volumenya, advantage-nya itu adalah interaksi dari cahaya dan material itu uh, tinggi karena intensitasnya tinggi ya dalam dalam area yang sangat kecil. Tapi curse-nya adalah impact dari dari roughness dan losses itu lebih tinggi. 
On the other hand, kalau kita punya uh, waveguide yang sangat besar, interaksi dari light dan matter juga tidak terlalu kuat, tapi impact dari losses lebih rendah. Apa menjawab pertanyaannya, Mas? Ya, Pak. Terima kasih, Pak. Oh ya, sama-sama. Oke. Okay. Nah, sebelumnya apa? Ya, nah kita baru bicara masalah losses ya. So um, uh, this is just a, a cartoon. So this is a cartoon, but then uh, this is a same image of an optical waveguide. Ya, seperti aku bilang, um, optical waveguide rectangular waveguide sendiri uh, biasanya uh, proses fabrikasinya adalah uh, ada deposisi dari material core itu sendiri dan um, ada proses litografi dan etching yang um, membentuk um, to form the, the 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 actual optical waveguide itself and um, the fact that the 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 the, the side wall is not really smooth will lead to scattering losses right so if you take this kind of a uh, straight wave guide what sort of losses that you can expect first of course is absorption so for some wavelengths depending on the band gap uh, uh, material absorbs those wavelengths right so that depends on the type of material and then the wavelength that you use for example if you want to use visible light like this right you cannot use silicon because silicon is absorbing for this kind of uh, uh, wavelength. So below one micron, you cannot transmit it. For silicon nitride, you can use visible wavelength <clears throat> and so on and so forth, right? So for infrared, for example, then the absorption uh, for, the, for the material in typical um, material like uh, silicon nitride is actually pretty low right so it's not the absorption that you consider most of the time you are dealing with scattering and this scattering is indeed induced by material defects in the waveguide itself or most likely the roughness of your um, <clears throat> surfaces of the waveguide right and of course, something that uh, I will not treat in this uh, particular lecture is that you also have two photon absorption or nonlinear absorption in various material, and this is also depending on the the band gap energy of this material. So uh, when uh, it um, it fits, let's say the band gap, then um, your light will be absorbed. Okay um but then if you take a look at this scattering loss right what are the parameters that play a role so this is a, a, a rather simplistic formula that people have come up uh, to with to uh, estimate what sort of scattering loss you get from a typical waveguide right so the the loss itself is proportional to make sense the roughness of the interfaces right and this is usually, um, uh, yeah, yeah, this kind of roughness is, a, is, a, is kind of random. So you take a root mean square of this kind of surface roughness. Okay. Um, and then the other part is that you have the index contrast, as we mentioned before, right? So the higher the, high, the index contrast, the higher the impact of the surface roughness to the scattering loss, right? And then the other part is that the intensity that touches the surface. And this is, of course, depending on how you distribute your light inside an optical waveguide. So if you can see, okay, what is, and this is really a key question in integrated optics, right? how do you make a low loss waveguide right assuming that you don't have to worry about the absorption and on your losses so you go to this formula uh, first answer is that to make your waveguide smooth right uh, of course this is particularly uh, an ugly waveguide with a lot of roughness 
people have done much better, right? So they do chemical polishing of the top surface, for example. Um, they do a different kind of reflow technique and annealing to make uh, uh, side walls and then the surfaces very smooth. Sometimes they do atomic layer deposition, very small layer to actually fill, fill the gaps, let's say, that can cause scattering and so on and so forth. Do you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, biasanya sih, kalau umpamanya um, kita bikin image dari waveguide-nya dan bisa dilakukan pengukuran dari uh, image, imaging dari waveguide tersebut. Uh, ya, Um, jadi sebenarnya um, kalau um, yang yang diambil biasanya hanya sebagian section dari waveguide-nya. Jadi nggak semua seluruh panjang di image dan jadi ada asumsi juga bahwa bergantung dari prosesnya uh, distribusi apa yang bisa kita dapat dari roughness ini. Jadi biasanya kalau namanya foundry ya melakukan fabrikasi dari waveguide seperti ini, mereka juga kan melakukannya berkali-kali gitu ya, dan mereka juga menentukan yieldnya seperti apa. Dari situ mereka juga punya feeling atau punya formula yang menentukan oke okay, distribusi dari roughness ini seperti apa sih? Karena it's a random process, right? So it's not deterministic that you will have roughness here. And sometimes you have a bit more in this part and so on and so forth. So if they know this distribution. They know what sort of uh, yeah varian variants yeah, variants dari uh, uh, surface roughness ini sendiri. Nah, informasi itulah yang dipakai untuk mengestimasi uh, what sort of scattering loss that they will have. Yeah. Uh, jadi. Kalau dari sisi praktisnya adalah uh, kalau umpamanya kita punya wave type silikon umpamanya ya um, kalau umpamanya kita send light into the the, the silicon wave guide kalau umpamanya punya scattering scatteringnya let's say biasanya scattering loss itu di di uh, apa ya di express it's expressed in Um, dB or decibels per unit length. The typical silicon waveguide has around, I don't know, 3 dB per centimeter. So if I have one centimeter of silicon waveguide, um, I will lose 3 dB in the end. That means that I will lose half of my light, right? Now imagine that if I put one milliwatt of power into the silicon waveguide, I will get half a milliwatt. At the output, right? Now, if I increase this to 10 milliwatt, right, I will have 5 milliwatt at the output. Now, if I increase it to 100 milliwatts, right, I supposed to get 50 milliwatt at the output, but I won't. Why? Because then, uh, for a certain uh, enough energy. Uh, of light into the material, there's a nonlinear absorption. So photons will be absorbed uh, such that um, I cannot increase my light transmission anymore. And that is a, a big problem in semiconductor uh, waveguides because then uh, usually um, you have to combat this kind of losses linear loss, I call it scattering linear loss with pumping higher and higher power, but then at some point, all my photons that will make up my signal will be absorbed, right? And then uh, it, it, it grows with the, the intensity of light, and that means that I have a smaller signal-to-noise ratio at the output. It's related to the That is... 
Yeah. Yeah, but then yeah. Yeah. So it's a non-linear uh, loss. It increases quadratically. Yeah. Okay. Where were we? Okay. So we talk about recipe, right? Uh, and this is really the recipe that people have uh, uh, used to design integrated uh, low loss integrated optic circuit. So, um, how to make low loss waveguide? First, you make your waveguide smooth, as I mentioned before. And then, second, you choose your index contrast. So, you choose your material. So, if if very high index contrast, of course, it gives a lot of benefit, but also gives a lot of uh, drawback because of losses, then you choose uh, uh, different materials. So you will see later that there are different materials that have been considered to, to, to make optical waveguide. And then the other one that is also very important is that you engineer the shape of the modes, right? So. For example, if you have this cladding material, I hope that I'm using the right one. So I can, yes, <laughs> because otherwise that will be bad, right? So, okay, this is the core, right? So this is N core, and this is N cladding. So depending on this core and cladding material, um, you have a certain kind of index contrast, right? Okay, depending on this index contrast, uh, you can also design the geometry of your uh, waveguide. So width and then height, let's say, to make sure that it is uh, a monomode waveguide, right? To have a single mode waveguide. Now, different geometry uh, will also determine what is the light distribution in this um, in this waveguide? So um, you can have a light distribution like this, right? So if you if you take a look at this, then you really have this kind of uh, light distribution, right? Where not much of the light intensity really touches the, the interface between the cladding and the core, right? Uh, that means that the mode is well confined. And if you don't have a lot of light touching this rough um, interfaces, right? Then you are minimizing this, right? So this um, uh, intensity at the surface compared to the entire intensity of the waveguide uh, is the one that I'm describing here, right? So if, let's say I misdesign it with a, with a different geometry, I don't know, something like this, and then there is light, a, a lot of light touching the surfaces, then I will have more probability of scattering those photons and not guiding it, right? So from this very simple equation, you have the idea now of how to make low loss waveguide and or what sort of knobs, what sort of uh, techniques that you can use to optimize it, right? So this is very fabrication related, making recipes of very smooth sidewalls, uh, polished uh, top, uh surface and so on and so forth this is engineering in terms of choosing the material and this one is really design mode engineering to be able to make sure that there's not much light touching the the rough surfaces any question yes no. Triangular waveguide. I think there must be somebody who's done it, but it's so impractical, right? Because then you have to edge in an angle, and then there's a lot of yeah, this kind of sharp corners. So I haven't seen any practical implementation. So typically, 
you make wave kites with this kind of uh, geometry. Of course, and you will see later that you don't have to etch all the way. Okay, so. So typically, what, what you have to make wave guides, right? So typically, you have a wafer. This is silicon, right? You have a carrier material, which is silicon. And then um, Yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. So you have a silicon wave kite with some buried oxide layer. Yeah. So you 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 have a oxidized oxidized uh, silicon silicon oxide. Let's say uh, in 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 a layer on top of the silicon wafer. So this is silicon oxide. Right, um, and then you can deposit your material. For example, you deposit silicon nitride, and then you want to do lithography and etching. Yes. Okay. So um, then you have to do lithography and etching to define your wave guide, right? Um, so, for example, to get to this kind of wave guide, uh, you remove this material such that you etch all the way down such that this is your silicon nitride. Okay. And of course, if you have silicon nitride with index of 1.9, if you leave it in air, right, index of one, then you have very high index contrast, but then that can be a bad recipe if you have roughness, right? So what they did typically is just to put more silicon oxide as the cladding. So then this is your waveguide, right? Silicon oxide, silicon oxide, silicon nitride. But you don't have to etch all the way. What you can do is to make this kind of rip, right? Where it's etched only shallow. Now, the kind of modes that you have if you etch all the way or you don't etch all the way is different, right? So maybe if you etch all the way, right? Then light will be distributed like this, and then you will have uh, light touching. I didn't do that. No. Hello? Anyway, right? So then light will touch your surfaces, but then if you etch very shallow, for example, then you can make light distribution like this, for example, right? So these kind of surfaces don't see a lot of intensity of light. And this is mode engineering. This is changing this, right? And so these kind of foundries that makes this kind of you know, integrated photonics, they make money by perfecting this, but also perfecting this. It's as important how you make your surface smooth or how do you make waveguide where the light distribution is well engineered such that you don't have this kind of problems with uh, light touching the rough surfaces, right? So this is a slide that I borrowed from Lukas Krastowski from uh, University of British Columbia. 
in uh, in Canada. He's one of the guru of silicon photonics. He's giving a lot of courses and so on and so forth. And this is basically repeating the same information, right? So primarily you have a roughness on your side walls. And then what Lucas is doing really well is to have this kind of uh, uh, simulations for the mode profiles of a given uh, integrated optical wave type. For example, this is silicon, I believe. So the index contrast is very high. And then you see that uh, at the boundary of the wave that you have significant light uh, presence touching the surfaces, right? So, and this roughness will scatter light, right? So scattering from surface depends on the mode shape. So this kind of mode engineering is something that I was mentioning about an amount of light at the edge of the waveguide. Um, and these uh, value uh, is typical for silicon. For silicon nitride is different. Okay, yeah. For silicon nitride is different. Um, and then um, roughness can also lead to backscattering. So backscattering will manifest as light traveling backward, let's say. And then if you have a resonator, that can also cause problems because then you have this kind of mode splitting of your resonator. Okay, what do I have next? Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, this is just showing, I already, while answering the question, I was already mentioning about the, the alpha, which is the parameter. We use to communicate our waveguide losses in dB per unit length, right? So as I mentioned before, for silicon, it's typically two, let's say one to three dB per centimeter. Right? So if you have one centimeter waveguide, you can lose one dB or half of your uh, intensity. And of course, um, as, a, as a big fan of silicon nitride, these kind of losses are rubbish, right? One to three dB per centimeter is just too high, right? Um, silicon nitride, we are talking about sub one dB per meter, right? So in one meter of waveguide, you lose less than one dB. Um, at least those are the, the records that they in silicon nitride waveguides. Um, just to check back, if everybody is paying attention. What is the loss of an optical fiber? I've shown it before. Anybody? Yes, but you're a teacher. I want, <laughs> I want the students to answer that. Okay, so he's, he's already showing uh, the direction of that. He said, anybody can answer me the precise number. 0.25 dB per kilometer for C band. Excellent. Is that also a teacher or? I'm a student. Okay, good. Somebody is paying attention. I don't know. Who, who, uh, who, uh, what, what's your name? Reza. Reza. Oh, okay. Reza. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. So, this is giving a context, right, of fiber versus integrated optics. Fiber is still 0.25 dB per kilometer in the seabed. The chip is one of course. Of course. But for some applications, certainly for our waveguides, I need a meter. Yeah. I need a meter of length. You know, nonlinear optics is weak, so I really need the length, right? So this kind of dB per meter should become the the, the standard. But then, yeah, okay, um, we'll see, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, ini, ini, ininya, okay. Um, pertanyaannya adalah mengapa negatif?
Oh, tapi kalau intensitas sendiri kan you take the conjugate. So you 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 multiply e with e star. So that means that you multiply this with its complex conjugate so you okay. Um, intensitas sendiri uh, didapatkan dengan cara mengalihkan medan dengan medan konjugasi ya. Med medan conjugate. Jadi enggak uh, So at the end of the day, you will have uh, the the correct formulation because then you replace it with plus i. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oke, okay, oke, okay, oke. Okay. Oke, okay, bagian ininya ya. Me, yeah, maybe then that is a typo. Ya, oke. Terus kayak case positif. Ya, yeah. ya. Yeah. Any other question? Oke. Okay. Okay. Nah, um, okay. So we have discussed about loss mechanisms in straight waveguides. Um, uh, things got a bit uglier when you ask light to go around the bands, right? But then going around the bands, uh, just want, I have to check the time. Yeah, okay. So we will stop 20 minutes before, right? So that means I have. 15-20 minutes. Okay. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. So um, uh, letting light go around the bands uh, is very important because then you save um, uh, area, right? So very simple. If you So let's say that I want I want to make a one meter waveguide, right? How do I do that? So I can make a chip one meter long. But of course, this is not feasible, right? Because then a, a typical chip dimension is determined. Okay, what is limiting the chip dimension? Typically, The, the dimension is limited by the wafer dimension, right? So you have three inch, six inch, eight inch wafers. And in these wafers, you have a lot of chips, right? And then there is also something called the reticle that limits the amount of designed uh, circuit that you can have inside this uh, area. So a one meter long chip is a no-go, right? So we make it a bit short. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we make it a bit shorter, right? Okay, let's say that the chip is this much. Okay, so um, if I want to make a, a one meter waveguide, then I have to go, let's say this one is, I don't know, one centimeter. I have to go one centimeter and then I have to go back, right? and do one centimeter again, and then I have to go back and then do one centimeter again, and so on and so forth, right? So if the band radius needs to be very big, then I have to, to go also very long for this chip, right? Because then uh, this curvature needs to be big. So it is desirable to be able to bend light in a very sharp corner because it increases dramatically, quadratically, the density of your chip. So if I can make it very sharp like this, right, 10 times sharper, then my area is actually much smaller compared to this one, right? 
So it's very desirable. But then, unfortunately, wait, where's my slide? stopping myself from cursing so <laughs> it's really bad i have to control myself anyway so uh, how how tight the bands should be depends on of course the design and the index contrast between your core and cladding right so if the 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 index contrast is very high we've talked about this like silicon on air on 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 insulator let's say then the mode volume is very tight and then you can actually make uh bands also very tight very short bands right that means that for silicon circuits uh, the size of the circuit is actually very small so if you if you are given a circuit you don't know what the material, you can guess what it is. If it's like, okay, this consists of five ring resonators and then some splitters and et cetera, and this this small, then it's a really good guess to say that um, it might be silicon, right? Uh, for silicon nitride, the index contrast is lower. So that means that the, 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 band, the bands, let's say, is a bit bigger, right? And wh what happened, let's say, uh to 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 uh to the losses mechanism related to these bands right so these guided modes actually will couple to radiation modes as it go travel uh, along the bands and then if you take a, a simulation of the mode at the bands let's say then then it's actually shifted towards the the outer region and this the the effective index of the mode at the outer region is lower. And then uh, because it's lower, it can be matched to a radiative modes that goes away from these bands, right? So now the question is that, okay, how can we estimate given a certain kind of mode profile and index contrast, the kind of band radius that you can get before losing your light, right? So that is the question. I will rephrase it. So for designers, for example, the question is that how can I design my waveguide and bands uh, to the minimum radius, to the shortest band, without additional loss? So the loss shouldn't come from the band. So this kind of uh, uh, figure would be quite useful. So this is a simulation of the index contrast of the waveguide and the kind of minimum bending radius when the band loss is not important anymore. So only 0.1 dB, let's say. So it's hardly adding to the total loss mechanism. And then you can see that the, this index contrast, the higher it is, the shorter the band can be. So for example, for Silicon, whose index contrast is typically at this regime, you can have around five micron of bands, right? So this kind of radius is only five microns, and then your circuit becomes really, really dense, right? With silicon nitride, where the index contrast, in this case, the index contrast is defined as the difference between the index of the core and the cladding. So one point nine or two versus 1.5 so you are in this region right the kind of band radius is um, uh, around 20 30 micron or so right and then of course this goes much uh, sharper so um, uh, another extreme is a silica waveguide so this silica waveguide is one of the first type of integrated photonic circuits that has been mass produced and commercialized. A lot of people uh, or groups and companies in Japan many years ago made this kind of silica circuit. And the way the waveguide is made is not by um, um, yeah, structuring and then uh, having a contrast between a different material of core and cladding, 
but then is to do the glass itself with germanium, for example. And then the amount of germanium that you can put into the glass will locally change the refractive index, and then you can mold it as an optical waveguide. But of course, this kind of doping uh, typically is in a low dose, let's say, and then the index contrast becomes really small, like 1%, right? So then you are really in this regime and then you end up with very big circuits, right? So there is no high density silica circuit because then the index contrast is very big. So um, again, foundries and people are trying to navigate this kind of curve and then is trying to tell, okay, what sort of material and then waveguide structure will be the best to make the highest density circuit. What I have to mention is that for designers, for example, that, okay, if you are given the material and say, okay, you have uh, 0.5, so you can go, uh, I don't know, around 30 micron bands. They never take the 30, right? They take 70, just to be safe. And that is very important. So uh, if you do this calculation and you talk to Foundry and say that you can actually make 30 micron, they will say, yeah, in theory, yes. But then, of course, there's a lot of, non-idealities in making this kind of circuits and so on and so forth, they always go with a safe bet. So for, for our uh, silicon nitride wave types, typically we do 75. Although then maybe we can do half of that, but then typically we do 75 or 100 micron. That gives good enough density of circuits that we, we, can, uh, we can do. Okay. I should stop. Okay, I will stop. I well, okay, maybe just a bit of uh, okay. So one thing that I will uh, uh, also treat tomorrow is that great we have the wave kites, but then most of our lasers are somewhere else, and then you have you know optical fibers that connect this laser with your circuit. How do you do coupling from from your laser to your photonic circuit, and what are the, the design issues, let's say, and then what are the solutions that we can do to be able to have efficient coupling or low loss coupling from one component to the other. Any last questions from the audience? Or you can also save your question for tomorrow. That's also fine. Any remark? Yeah, Alex. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. In here. Yeah. 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 It depends. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the question is that, uh, pertanyaannya adalah, uh, ab, uh, ada kompensasi antara uh, field yang menyentuh surface dengan indeks kontras. Uh, jadi sebenarnya this is balancing out, gitu ya. Not really true. Okay. So um, the, the reason is that, um, yeah, again, the distribution is also dictated by your geometry, right? So uh, if you make the wave type small, then still you have uh, some light uh, distributed uh, across your surfaces. But then, one more important thing is that in silicon wave guides, that is particularly not true because then the mode uh, is so small, then this is not strictly speaking TE polarization. Sometimes it's called quasi TE and you still have significant field uh, the sides of the wave guide. And this is just, uh, a thing in um, in um, in uh, silicon waveguides. 
So again, this is a blessing and a curse because then the curse is that you have a lot of loss. But then for me, I like optomechanics. So I like light that induce forces into material. So if you have a lot of force in this uh, interface between silicon and silicon oxide, you have a lot of radiation pressure, right? So people like to use silicon waveguide for some because of this light distribution, uh, but they have to pay in terms of the loss. So it's not so straightforward of um, uh, engineering this kind of modes to actually have low propagation loss. Yeah, Parahmat. Yeah. Ah. Ya, jadi pertanyaannya dari Pak Rahmat adalah kalau umpamanya kita memang mau mengirim informasi kita butuh low loss, tapi kalau misalnya kita mau sensing dengan cahaya mungkin kita nggak menginginkan itu kan? Ya, poinnya valid ya, tapi um, mungkin kalau umpamanya buat sensing kita biasanya pakai evanescent field. So it's not a loss mechanism because a loss mechanism you cannot collect it. Let's say you want to collect it systematically. So for typ typically for sensing, uh, if you have this kind of waveguide, you you etch a window, and then you open it in the top, for example, and then you have this kind of light that can interact with your analyte. Then of course you have to pay in terms of losses. But then, yeah, typically sensing is also done in a in a resonator, so you have advantage of light going around and around and around, and then you have a light built up inside the the resonator. So at, at least that's what my impression is in terms of uh, letting the light see something else instead of being confined in the waveguide. In terms of scattering. Yeah, typically we are also doing some sort of sensing, but then with coherent scattering, stimulated Riwang scattering. So it's hardly a loss mechanism that you just completely lose your signal. It scatters from one wavelength to another, but it's still coherent. I think it's a different kind of scattering. Terima kasih, Pak. Ya, Pak, saya ingin bertanya. Ya. Uh, terkait dengan material silikon nitride atau silikon, saya lihat Bapak juga uh, apa namanya bekerja di bidang nonlinear optik. Nah, al ada alasan nggak misalnya uh, kenapa memilih material high three nonlinear itu dibanding high two gitu? Misalkan uh, lithium niobate, di mana mungkin input powernya bisa lebih rendah untuk mendapatkan efisiensi yang besar. Oke. Okay. Pertanyaan, oh ya, oke. Okay. Pertanyaan udah bisa didengar semuanya. Uh, the choice of material depends on what you want to do, right? And what is available. So, for example, uh, Naibet is really nice. Um, it has Kai2, uh, so you can actually do electro-optic and uh, all sorts of this nice nonlinearity, but it's not so widely available. And then only recently it becomes really, really good. So lithium niobate is a material that you uh, have it in all your electro-optic modulator, but then in this kind of electro-optic modulator, the waveguide is very weak because again, this is used by titanium diffusion uh, into the lithium niobate crystal, right? And then typically you, you cannot build high density circuit for this kind of lithium niobate. Um, only recently in Harvard, Three years ago, the group of Marco Longcat developed this uh, way of argon milling the lithium niobate crystal to make really high quality waveguides. Then you can have a nanophotonic device with high density and all the goodness of nonlinear optics from lithium niobate. 
But if I want to get one chip, I have to pay 25K, right? Uh, $25,000 for a single chip. So it's still being really tightly controlled by only a few groups. If I want to do silicon or silicon nitride, I can have many options. There are a few companies in silicon, iMac, and then um, others, and then uh, silicon nitride, Lionix, Ligentech, that produces this kind of uh, uh, circuits, but it cannot do what lithium niobate can do. It doesn't have second, it doesn't have strong second order nonlinearity. You can do tricks to make silicon nitride do second order nonlinearity. It has been done in EPFL. There's a few papers uh, came out or coming out on this. Uh, but it's just practicality. Sometimes in integrated optics, it's really about practicality, what you can access and then what you can have. Terima kasih banyak, Pak. Okay. Terima kasih. Okay. Terima kasih. Sampai besok. Kita bisa bilang terima kasih ke Pak David. Uh, Bapak Ibu, silakan untuk keperluan administrasi saja kita perlu absensi bit.ly/integrated_photonics_l1. Ya. Untuk absen aja ini untuk keperluan administrasi kita. Tolong diisi. <laughs> Oke, okay, terima kasih. Jadi besok kita akan lanjutkan kuliah ini. Tadi sedikit sudah ditunjukkan Pak David. Topik berikutnya adalah bagaimana coupling in salah satunya ya. Ya, setelah kita bicara tentang coupling in, kita bicara tentang uh, different type of integration. Bagaimana kita bisa integrating different material, and then how to build components. So that will be for this week, a bit basic, and then next week we will do applications, systems. Oke, okay, jadi besok kita kumpul lagi di sini jam 13. Ya, terima kasih untuk hadirannya semua. Terima kasih juga buat para hadirin di ruang Zoom dan mungkin juga ada yang menonton via YouTube. Kuliah pagi ini kita tutup sekian. Sampai jumpa besok pada jam 13 di link Zoom yang sama. Terima kasih.